When the Dallas Mavericks received Daniel Gafford at the trade deadline, at first, there wasn't much publicity. That's because most folks weren't aware of who Daniel Gafford was, as he was rotting away on the Washington Wizards. It wasn't until he came close to breaking Will Chamberlain's record for the most consecutive shots made when he finally got recognized on a national scale. It made people realize, oh, this is a legitimate big man who could run, jump, dunk, block, catch alley-oops. He was seemingly the perfect big man to compliment Luka Doncic, who spent a long time carrying a mediocre and injured Mavs team. With this acquisition, they immediately improved. How's it going folks, my name's Andy, and in today's video, we're gonna take a look at how Daniel Gafford and four other unsung heroes who don't get much exposure, but they are absolutely vital to their team's success. As mentioned earlier, Gafford was so close to breaking Will Chamberlain's record of 35 straight shots made. In the game where he was supposed to break the record, Luka did not play. And, unsurprisingly, Gafford finally missed his 34th attempt, ending his streak at 33. However, Gafford's impact goes way beyond that. Whenever Luka and Gafford are on the floor together, the Mavs have a ridiculous plus 9.7 net rating. But when Luka is on the floor without Gafford, the Mavs are only plus 4.3. His ability to convert shots at the rim is exactly what this team needed. Because not only do opponents have to be aware of him lurking the paint, but he lures the attention away from Luka, away from Kyrie. At least for a few seconds, and that's all they need. Now, you could say Derek Lively also provided that, even before Gafford arrived. But his rookie season has been plagued with injuries. And when he's not playing, the Mavs didn't have a single big who could replicate that. They didn't have anyone who could do what Gafford could. It's been this franchise's biggest Achilles heel for most of Luka's career. This can be seen in the previous several seasons. The Mavs have routinely ranked at the bottom or near the bottom in points in the paint. But after getting Gafford, they've averaged 52.4 points in the paint, good for 7th best in the entire NBA, and around the same number of points in the paint as the Denver Nuggets. With the arrival of Gafford and the drafting of Derek Lively, the Mavs finally have two bigs who can run with Luka. It seems like every night, Gafford gets like 5 or 6 dunks, just from catching passes at the rim. In a game against the Utah Jazz, the Mavs broke a franchise record with 18 dunks in a single game. 10 of those came from Gafford alone. He is not a new school stretch 5 center who wants to fade out and shoot threes. This is a legitimate big man who's not just big in size, but he plays big. Gafford is 6'10", but he plays like a guy who's 7'2". A reporter once asked him a simple question. Why do you like dunking so much? To which Gafford responded, It brings energy to the building. You get the crowd into it. It just kind of feeds into the offensive side, and then we get stops on the other end too. Unsurprisingly, the Mavs have also been one of the league's best defensive teams since the trade. On a side note, Gafford also happens to excel in two skills that most people overlook. His ability to catch the ball, because he has great hands. And his ability to finish in traffic, without getting blocked or stripped. When the Mavs' points in the paint skyrocketed, their offensive efficiency did as well. Now they're taking higher quality shots, and with the gravity of Gafford, both Luka and Kyrie benefit from having more space. For a long time, Mark Cuban has been obsessed with trying to snatch a star in free agency. But it's the smaller, less glamorous trades like this that fly under the radar. It turned their team from struggling to make the playoffs to a legit contender. Herb Jones. Not on Herb. That's his nickname. Now, when you're a role player and you get a nickname like that, you know the rest of the NBA fears you. Herb came into the NBA as an older rookie, and he kind of flew under the spotlight, because there was nothing flashy or overtly exciting about his game. He came in as a multifaceted, level-headed player, who was good in many areas. But as the Pelicans won more and more games, Herb's impact is being shown in the spotlight. In particular, his defense. This team even made their own webpage dedicated to Herb Jones and his Defensive Player of the Year nomination. I could scour through the web to find the numbers myself, but they did it for me. 
Here are some stats. Ranked 11th in the NBA in defensive box plus minus. In defensive isolation, Jones is ranked 13th in points per possession. He's ranked 3rd in the NBA in contesting 3-point shots. His 2.6% steal rate is in the 96th percentile. You can find an endless highlight reel of Herb's best defensive possessions, and his best games. The first takeaway you'll get is, wow, why haven't I seen this guy that much before? Well, honestly, Herb has always been a great defender. It's just, the issue with role players who are great defenders is, you rarely hear about them if their team is losing. For years, the Pelicans were losing. It's not the fault of Herb, it's the Pelicans' hardships of injuries. So now with more recognition on a winning team, everyone now knows that Herb is one of, if not the best wing defender in the entire NBA. For centers and other big men, we tend to measure their defense by how well they defend the rim, or how well they defend the pick and roll on a switch. For perimeter players, however, we measure their defense by how well they defend the three-point line, or defend on the ball. Herb excels in both categories. I mentioned him allowing just 0.73 points per possession in isolation, which ranks him in the 97th percentile. But he also holds opponents to just 30.6% from the three-point line. Considering the average three-point percentage today is 36.7%, Herb is doing really well. It's not just his defense. Herb's improvement in his three-point shot has expanded the Pelicans' offense. Previously, defenders used to sag off of him and not pay attention to him at all. Now, Herb is a confident three-point shooter, and has gotten more comfortable handling the ball or running pick and rolls. He's quickly become a complete role player, who fills in everything the Pelicans need him to do, and more. Royce O'Neal The Phoenix Suns had the most anticipated season in a very long time. With the acquisition of Bradley Beal, a full season of Kevin Durant, and Devin Booker approaching his peak, this is their time to win, now. The results have been… Uh, kind of a mixed bag, I guess, due to injuries and the chemistry has been slow. And they were very top-heavy and needed better role players. Someone with intangibles who can help out their stars. In comes Royce O'Neal. You might recognize him from his days on the Utah Jazz. And in Phoenix, he's continuing where he left off. Yeah, yeah, I mean, being able to guard a few positions, being able to initiate and be a small ball, you know, four, three, you know, a guy you could throw the ball to and have him initiate the offense to get guys going. To play in the pocket a little bit and make those passes as well. Loves the game, loves his teammates, and I think people in the Valley will love watching him. While this trade deadline deal was brushed aside and not really talked about, right from the get-go, O'Neal added a much-needed level of toughness that this Suns team was sorely missing. He's always been known as a feisty defender, he fights through contact, and never gives up on a play. O'Neal's physical play and communication on defense is underappreciated. Even Frank Vogel took notice and immediately gave him more minutes. He told the reporters, quote, He's a great talker, and you feel his physicality out there. The Suns have no need for any more score-first, ball-dominant players. They have enough of that, they need guys like Royce O'Neal, who can do all the little things. Most importantly, by defending the opposing team's best perimeter threats, a huge burden is lifted off the shoulders of Devin Booker and Durant. Isaiah Hartenstein when Mitchell Robinson went down with an injury that took months to recover from, when Julius Randle went down with a season-ending shoulder injury, when Tom Thibodeau was forced to play the corpse of Taj Gibson, during all these horrific moments for the Knicks franchise, no way could we have thought this team was still a playoff team. I think people credit the Knicks' trade for OG Ananobi as the move that put them back on the map. But people forget Isaiah Hartenstein. This is the guy who's been keeping the Knicks above water. He filled in seamlessly for Mitchell Robinson and maintained the Knicks' dominance on the glass. He anchors a top 10 defense in the NBA despite all the injuries. He has the second highest offensive rebound percentage in the entire league, only behind Clint Capella. <laughs> Even offensively, he's more than just a guy who catches lobs at the rim. Hartenstein is a legitimately skilled offensive player with an actual bag. He ain't no DeAndre Jordan. 
seeing him succeed is a feel-good story. This was a guy who got drafted in the second round, and clawed his way up. Every minute he's out there, Hartenstein exemplifies everything good about Knicks basketball, and he brought his rugged playstyle to a franchise that desperately needed someone like him. Nas Reed While Nas Reed has become a living legend among the NBA community, he's not just a meme anymore. When Carl Anthony Towns went down with an injury, Nas Reed took his place and flourished. He immediately began averaging over 18 points a game as a starter, and shot 43% from three, with over seven attempts per game. That's even better than Towns himself. Reed slotted in and kept the Wolves afloat in his absence, and record-wise, they didn't fall off at all. While Reed doesn't have anywhere near the amount of talent as Cat, he makes up for it with his motor. He exemplifies passion. It makes sense, because he's been a bench player for the majority of his career, so in order to thrive in that role, he needs to hustle and play hard to earn his minutes. That's how he became such a popular figure in Minnesota, now, there are other aspects of his game that are quite unique for a power forward slash center. Nas can drive to the rim very well, converting 52% of the time on his drives, which is in the 86th percentile among all power forwards and centers. His handles are crisp, his spin moves are quick, his length and strength surprise you. Nas is surprisingly nimble for his size. The most crucial part of his development is that he's such a different player than Cat. While Cat is also a competent three-point shooter, he's more of a back-to-the-basket post-up player. On the other hand, Nas prefers to face up. With him in the lineup, sometimes it looks like they got four guards out there. It allows the Wolves to have a different look on offense, with more flexibility to play four out. Not to mention, his current three-year $41 million contract is very team-friendly. According to a report, other teams were willing to offer longer, four-year deals worth nearly 60 million, but Nas took a pay cut because he likes playing under Chris Finch. With the Wolves' starting front court set in stone, it's likely Nas will remain a bench player, unless somebody else gets hurt. But it's nice to know he can thrive as a starter as well. Anyway, that's all folks. Those were five of the NBA's greatest unsung heroes. Let me know if you can think of any other players who belong on a video like this. Players with incredible intangibles who provide so much for their teams, yet they don't get talked about much. Thank you all so much for watching, I hope y'all enjoyed the video, and of course, as always, I'll see you next time. Peace.